Across five different installments in our Best Shot series, we've explored scale, arrangement, the inanimate, lenses, and movement. But if we're talking all time, we better talk about time. In particular, how cinema distorts it. These are five more of cinema's best shots of all time, part six. Most traditional art, the kind you go to see in a museum, arranges an aesthetic experience through space. Paintings, sculptures, photography, architecture, they all usually spread their canvases across the two or three spatial dimensions. Cinema, like music, arranges things through time. In fact, like theater, it arranges things through both time and space, which means it has a lot of ways to play. Our exploration of best shots first considered how a shot can play spatially, how it can represent or transform its subject's size or shape by way of its framing, how it can make small things big in a close-up or big things small in a wide shot. And today, we're looking at how a shot can play temporally, how it can turn days into seconds or seconds into minutes, how it can distort and misrepresent time for artistic effect. Today, we're exploring how cinema transforms time. The first and most common way that this happens is with the all-too-familiar slow motion. The very origins of cinema came from a desire to slow down time and look more closely into moments too fleeting to grasp through human means by way of an argument about a horse's gallop. Hollywood legend has it that a horse trainer made a bet with photographer Edward Muybridge that all four of a horse's feet never left the ground at the same time and got proven wrong by the invention of cinema. The bet probably wasn't real. More likely, the two men were just mutually curious. Nevertheless, Muybridge took a dozen pictures in a fraction of a second and then played them back out much slower than he took them and a rudimentary form of slow motion was developed. So wait, that means the camera runs faster to make things move slower? Think about it like this. Film is normally shot and projected at 24 frames per second, which means there are 24 different images plucked out of each second on set, and then given back to the audience at the same rate, each image comprising 1 24th of a second at both ends. But if instead a camera moves twice as fast as normal and captures 48 frames out of one second, which are then shown back to audiences 24 at a time, the effect is that each fraction of a second on set is stretched to twice its usual length. In this way, slow motion is a temporal close-up, a magnification of time rather than space, blowing up each single second into more. The question, of course, is why? Or maybe, so what? What does transforming time in this way do for me, the viewer? If you're Edward Moybridge, maybe it helps you win a bet. It allows you to peer more closely into a moment that might otherwise end too soon. Akira Kurosawa did it in The Seven Samurai to extend the duel of a master swordsman that a non-master swordsman would have missed. Jean-Luc Godard did it in Every Man for Himself, although he didn't run his camera any faster on set, he just stretched out the frames by step printing. Some filmmakers do this to lend extra musicality and rhythm to the everyday, to make sh** look cool in countless shots like these in Man with a Movie Camera, Chariots of Fire, De Niro's introduction long shot in Mean Streets. This shot from the opening titles of Reservoir Dogs or any number of these shots from the very famous Matrix elevator sequence. But it can also have the feeling of choosing to linger on a moment, as if the camera didn't want it to end. The final shot from Rushmore has this effect. Of course, it can also trap you in a moment you would prefer to end, as in this one from The Shining, this one from Apocalypse Now, and these from Antichrist. At its most poignant, slow motion can make things feel like one of those rare events you look back on and say time seemed like it slowed down, expanded in our memories with heightened importance. The first shot of Margot's arrival in the Royal Tenenbaums feels very much like this. But there is no one quite the master of this effect as Wong Kar Wai. As in the moments of almost intimacy from In the Mood for Love, the moment when Po Wing leaves Faye and Happy together, and for our first pick, an otherwise entirely ordinary moment with a drink and a longing gaze from Chungking Express. In its second half, we follow the story of Cop 663 and snack bar worker Faye, who secretly longs for him. Every day he purchases the same meal for his girlfriend after his shift until one day she suddenly leaves him and leaves a note for him at the snack bar, which he finds and we get this.
This moment feels like it's been preserved in amber, as if the whole world is racing by, oblivious to something absolutely historical happening to just this tiny pocket of it and the two people in it. And this is no ordinary slow motion. Here, as throughout Chungking Express, Wong Kar Wai combines a frame-repeating step print with long exposures to create a dreamy, clippy effect that feels both fast and slow at once. And there is a cheat going on here. It's not actually the camera that's doing all of the slowdown. Tony Leung's COP663 is himself heightening things by just moving his arm very, very slowly. But the effect is the same. They're separated from the rest of the world in space, foreground versus mid ground, but the time distortion separates them even further, as if they literally had their own entire timeline where only the two of them mattered. As if time moved differently for Faye, whose eyeline tells us she is the only one who seems to notice how important it is. Cop 663 might be looking the other way and missing it, but for Faye and us watching, we're witnessing a moment that won't be soon forgotten. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you get fast motion, achieved by running a camera very slowly, capturing only a few frames every second, and then playing them back at full speed. The effect is of compressing how long things take, packing more moments into fewer, of leaping across minutes of story in the span of you, the viewer's seconds, like an extreme wide shot of time rather than space. And ask yourself, how does this feel compared to normal speed? To us, it feels a bit like mania or freneticism, from the joyful kind in a hard day's night, to the dangerous in Romeo and Juliet, to the terrifying in Jacob's Ladder. It can feel superhuman, done a dozen different ways in comic book movies and especially here, representing the speed of telecommunication in the opening shot of Three Colors Red. At its extreme, you get the time lapse, as whole days and lifetimes and eras fly by before our eyes. Like in these shots from Zodiac, Adaptation, and especially Koyana Skatsi, the effect of which invites us to almost step outside of time in order to view humanity from a non-human perspective. But our favorite use of this technique imbues a feeling of carelessness with respect to time, as if it were not being regarded as precious. In shots like these from Click, this from Requiem for a Dream, and our favorite, and the one that surely inspired it, this one here from A Clockwork Orange. Alex is the leader of a dystopian, futuristic gang of codpiece-wearing violent criminals who meets a pair of women at a record store and invites them home with him for a classical music listening party and some of the old in-out, in-out. What follows is this shot. This is a contender for one of the least sexy sex scenes ever filmed. In as much as slow motion makes everything look very cool, fast motion can make it look terribly hammy. William Tell serving here as little more than a highfalutin yakety sax, but that's kind of the point. There's no elegance to this encounter, no savory, no delight in it, only drug-addled wildness, boundless energy, and a lack of focus. The fast motion of it says that this time is so unimportant that much of it can be thrown away. It is something to be chewed through with reckless abandon. There's lots to spare and plenty to lose with hardly an impression or memory made of it along the way. Contrast that to the slow motion later on in the film when Alex lashes out in violence after his gang attempts to overthrow him, one of the few times Stanley Kubrick used slow motion in his entire career, and you see how much more intimacy there is to the violence of the film than to its sex, which lends very important context to other moments in the film. Of course, there's no rule that says time has to move at a constant speed. Speed ramping is simple enough for anyone with a smartphone to accomplish these days, but for a while it was a pretty revolutionary technique, achieved by varying a camera's frame rate while it's in the process of rolling. Just as camera movement shifts a shot's relationship to space before our eyes, speed ramping shifts its relationship to time. If slow motion is a close-up in time, then speed ramping is a zoom in on time. This can draw attention toward certain moments and away from others without sacrificing a sense of continuity by inserting an edit. Zack Snyder famously built a whole action aesthetic around this, guiding the audience towards the most impactful parts of every fight by expanding and contracting the flow of time around them. But the speed ramp can also draw our attention towards the uneven nature of time, or its perception, towards a contrast. Consider Guy Ritchie's treatment of Sherlock Holmes. Each ramp makes us notice the difference in how Sherlock perceives the flow of time through a fight compared to how the rest of us do. Same goes for The Matrix the ramp into bullet time highlighting the development of Neo's superhuman abilities. But 
Our favorite example of the speed ramp comes from an already famous shot from Contact. Jodie Foster plays Dr. Ellie Arroway, an astrophysicist with SETI who learned her passion for radio astronomy from her father. She tells her on-again, off-again fling Matt McConaughey about her dad passing away, and we get a flashback to this. Much has been made of this shot's unexpected and seemingly impossible pullback through a mirror, which is certainly worth appreciating. But there is a subtler, less appreciated surprise, and it's the time ramp as Ellie rounds the stairs, where the change in speeds seems to turn time itself into an enemy. The only uncertainty, the entirety of the drama, comes from wondering whether she will get there fast enough, whether she will get there in time. And by using a ramp rather than a cut, the shot shifts our attention subtly towards the time component of things and focuses us more intently on the primary driver of the drama of the scene. Our heart continues to beat fast while Ellie increasingly moves slow and an inescapable sense of doom emerges, like the fundamental forces of the universe were stacked against her father. As if the further she moves down the hallway, the longer each next step takes, as if she were swimming upstream through time, which is surely how it must have felt to be in her position. And it is important to remember that the shifting, expanding, and contracting nature of time, even as space seems not to change, is not only important to the formal aesthetics of the film, it is quite literally a plot point around which the entire end of the film hinges, which makes this an especially brilliant use of the speed ramp effect. Now, if you want to get really extreme with time, you might just want to flip it on its head, invert its order, put effects before causes, make the end the beginning, and the beginning the end. You might just play things in reverse. It's the temporal equivalent of shooting upside down, and a cinematic technique with no real-world perceptual analog other than watching a VCR rewind. Which, by the way, Funny Games uses almost literally to rewind itself and undo its own narrative. This unnaturalness can give the time-reversed shot a strange and un canny feeling, played for eerie dreaminess in shots like this from Twin Peaks, or for comedy in shots like this in Top Secret. But it does kind of resemble the process of searching through your memories for first causes, of looking back at what might have started something that you originally missed. Mother returns to a flashback in reverse for this effect, and Memento's brilliant first shot begins like this, managing to set up the entire narrative structure in the process. Of course, if moving backwards through time were a real thing people could do, it would look a whole lot like this, so Tenet has loads of very cool examples of this shot. But there's something especially beautiful and interesting happening at the very end of The Diving Bell and The Butterfly, which we're going to spoil a little bit right now, but no more than a Wikipedia article about its author would. We wake up from a coma with Jean-Dominic Bobby, editor of Elle magazine, to find that he has locked-in syndrome, rendering him incapable of movement, speech, or any kind of communication. We follow him as he begins an arduous recovery, almost entirely from first-person perspective. One night, he is left in his room with a TV on, blaring a test pattern, alone with his thoughts and no ability to turn it off the entire night. He begins to imagine himself as if he were adrift in a diving bell. Then we cut to this. Eventually, he learns to dictate via the blink of only one eye. He writes a memoir, sees its release, and develops pneumonia a few days later. The movie ends like this. Bernard 
Jean-Dominique Bobby, 43 ans, journaliste réputé, père de famille, homme libre, projetait d'écrire un roman sur la vengeance au féminin. The first reversed shot at the moment of his death hits us with a wallop in the heart. And it seems to us that by reversing this shot here, director Julian Schnabel is working on four different levels in order to create an effect that is almost overwhelming. First, the literal level. Icebergs are put back together. Something unusually good has happened. Nature is recovering. Second, as a metaphor. What has been broken is healed. Parts become the whole again. Something unfalls apart. Third, as a part of an image system. Whatever happened in that scene where we first saw the glaciers break apart, this is their unhappening. Whatever loneliness, isolation, mental anguish they represented, the reversal of the footage says this is the anti-that. This is the undoing of a moment in pain entirely alone and feeling abandoned. And finally, fourth, as pure poetry. Playing this footage in reverse invites us to step back from the literalness of the imagery towards the purely imagistic, to the unadulterated sensory and emotional experience of watching the look of it. When seeing things from a new angle that you've never seen before, you get to see them with new eyes, appreciate them on different levels, notice details you normally edit out. This image has its own beauty and power separate from its meaning. It is stunning just to look at, even outside of context. And this reversal invites us to do just that. When played in reverse, these images transcend simple documentary. As the iceberg comes back together, the image becomes cinema, and Jean Do Bobby gets to go home. Finally, having stretched it, squeezed it, whipped it around, and played it backwards, the last big thing a shot can do with time is to stop it entirely. This is the freeze frame, traditionally accomplished by optically printing and reprinting a single frame over and over again until a single instant is stretched across a length of time and becomes a still photograph. Done first by Hitchcock and Champagne, it's often used to highlight particular moments, like an insert shot on a slice of time, seen here in Pieces of April and here in the other half of Chungking Express. It stops the flow of time, and for this reason, it's great for representing death. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and Thelma and Louise trap their main characters in celluloid in a frozen moment, but as its name suggests, it has the effect of freezing the narrative flow, even as the audience continues to move normally through time. This can have the effect of inviting them to step outside the story, outside the movement of it, to see it from an almost atemporal top-down view. It's why you get a lot of freeze frames used to introduce characters, like this earliest one from It's a Wonderful Life, or these from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, Goodfellas, Train Spotting, and Pulp Fiction. It's also an opportunity to halt the narrative and draw the audience's attention to that halting. This happens in the final moments of The Breakfast Club, Once Upon a Time in America, and famously and iconically in The 400 Blows. It's like the freeze frame says, you, the audience, get to carry on, but the story doesn't. But nowhere has this been done more excitingly, more beautifully, more meaningfully or masterfully than at the end of Satyajit Ray's Charulata. Charlotta and her husband Bupati have a loveless marriage. She dreams of writing and poetry while he is interested only in politics and pays little attention to her. Her boredom grows daily, so her husband invites his cousin Amal to keep her company. They bond over a shared love of the arts, and gradually it becomes clear that they have complicated feelings for each other. Amal, overwhelmed by guilt, suddenly leaves, and when Bupati walks in on Charu crying over his departure, he too realizes what has happened. He leaves in hurt, finally returns, and then we get this.
This series of freeze frames, particularly this very first one, was inspired by the ending of 400 Blows, but here, rather than freezing the story in a state of general flux, Ray suspends things suddenly on the precipice of an apparent resolution, in a state of visceral incompleteness, and there are a number of ways to interpret this. In one sense, this sudden stop at the doorstep of resolution says to the audience that the film will not be providing any, and that if the audience wants closure, they'll have to provide it themselves. In another sense, this shot could be read instead as the final place that the film arrives, the freeze frame of it signaling to us that there is no closer for Charu and Bupati to get. This state of frustrated togetherness is where their marriage ends up. This feeling we feel of having something we were looking forward to taken away from us yet dangled in plain sight is the story's emotional destination. Sure, they may literally clasp hands in a few seconds story time, but in a greater sense, they will always be a few inches apart. Ray freezes us to live in that. The music suddenly stops. The camera examines the details of the scene without unfreezing time, and then it backs away from their halted reunion, as if to leave even this moment behind to let it be. Each of these shots shows us a different temporal transformation, stretching out a frozen instant across an entire minute miraculously unwinding it, expanding it or compressing it for our benefit, even changing time's distortion across time. Each is a different way of mapping the story world's timeline onto our own. Each is a reminder that the movie camera captures not only an angle in space, but in time, and that it therefore has the ability to affect the way it represents both. And these five shots are some of the best examples of how brilliant filmmakers have used that potential to tell more immersive stories about the human experience, which is why we think they're five more of the best shots of all time. So what do you think? Disagree with any of our picks? Do we leave out any of your favorite time-distorting shots? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more Cinefix movie lists.